So I'm here to talk about Backstage, which is an, an open platform for building developer portals. Uh, and it's a product that we initially started developing at Spotify over four years ago. And we released as open source in March. And, and uh, before I, I do a demo uh, of, of the actual open source product, uh, I will give you just a short like overview of what Backstage is and what problem it tries to solve. So as I said, I'm a, uh, I work in what we call the Spotify platform organization, where we basically develop all of our infrastructure. So my customers on a daily basis are engineering teams at Spotify. And Spotify is organized as very many small uh, autonomous uh, engineering teams. Uh, and our job who works in the platform organization is try to try to make their lives as easy as possible, try to build as much infrastructure that makes them you know, iterate faster on their full uh, product life cycle. Uh, the, the first question I think is important to ask is like, what problem is Backstage trying to solve? So essentially the sort of infrastructure open source landscape uh, is just uh, getting bigger and bigger. Uh, the uh, uh, CNCF, which is the Cloud Native Computing Foundation uh, has over like uh, almost like 1500 projects. And we have definitely built our share of projects and internal tools at Spotify, over 200 of those actually. And I mean, it's fantastic that we have all these technologies, but there's also a sort of a downside for this. Uh, so if you look at, uh, this is actually from the CNCF and these are a few of the sort of more popular open source projects out there. And as I said, these are, it's fantastic that we have this like plethora of tooling available to us, but all these different tools are essentially built as different products, different things that are meant to be used almost like on their own. And what happens when you start to adopt more and more of these kind of infrastructure tools is that it becomes harder and harder for an engineer to understand like what are the, all the tools that are available and also how do they work? So basically there's a lot like a, a, what we saw at Spotify was that like the more tools we added and the more infrastructure teams we started to create, the more complex it, our ecosystem became essentially. And it actually came to a point where we saw that our engineers started to slow down because they couldn't find the tools. And they were basically, in order to do the basic, let's say a workflow of uh, you know, following their code from commit all the way out into production, they needed to jump between five, six, seven, sometimes eight different tools to do that job. And they lost track and, and basically the complexity started to slow people down. So we took a radically different approach at Spotify. And we have this basically philosophy here that we don't think that an engineer should have to be expert in infrastructure in order to be productive. So we basically think that you should be able to do your job and focus on you know, shipping your code, shipping your feature, and the infrastructure should be kind of abstracted away for you as much as possible. And that's why we build Backstage. So Backstage, you can look at it as a single pane of glass for your whole platform. Rather than asking your engineers to kind of understand and know and become experts in various infrastructure tools, uh, there's a single place to go to find all your tools, all the technical documentation, all the teams, basically like solving discoverability for your tech ecosystem at the same time helping engineers to create software in a more opinionated way. And we have really seen that this has had a dramatic effect on our uh, engineers. Uh, I think one of the, my favorite kind of proof points of this is that uh, we used to, before we had Backstage, we used to measure, we still do, how long it takes to uh, get onboarded as a new engineer. Spotify is a company that grows a lot. So we add a lot of new engineers all the time. Sometimes like, you know, 30, 40 new engineers per week. Uh, and it's really crucial that they are, they can quickly get up to speed. 
well, what we saw as I talked about our ecosystem was kind of growing in complexity, we actually saw that our engineers were starting to slow down. New engineers that all got onboarded, we measure it by time until you merge your 10th pull request. Uh, and basically, as we were growing as company, that number was slightly like steadily going up. So we uh, understood that we need to new, do something about it. And even if your company is kind of not onboarding 40 engineers per week, that metric, that number like, is actually uh, a good proxy for kind of measuring the overall complexity of your ecosystem. So if you get that down, we believe also that it strongly correlates to like your other engineers will have a better job, easier to find things, it's easier for them to get unstuck and easier for them to get like, you know, ship code into production. So we were actually able to cut like that onboarding time down from 55 days to 22 days, which is like 55% decrease after releasing backstage and consolidating all of our infrastructure into one single pane of glass. Backstage also helps with standardizing the way we create software. So as I said, we have a more opinionated way. We basically have a templated solution. So you say that if I want to create a new microservice, I don't start from scratch. I basically go into backstage, I click a few buttons, and then I get a hello world, uh, you know, microservice uh, running in production with CI built in, with technical documentation integrated. We do a mark uh, docs-like code approach. Uh, and basically all of our opinions about how you should develop a microservice at Spotify are built into the user, to the developer experience in Backstage. That makes it possible, easier for people to basically build robust systems at scale. And all those different systems that we build look similar so that uh, we use the same technology stack and we kind of allow teams to solve their own problems, but we also make sure that there's a standardized way where, uh, how we build software at, at the company. So how does it all work? Um, at the core of Backstage, we have this, uh, what we call the Backstage Service Catalog or the actually a software catalog. It keeps track of all your software, your microservices, your data pipelines, your websites, uh, different modules inside your mobile applications, our M machine learning models, basically everything, all the different smaller software pieces that make up the bigger Spotify sort of service are all tracked and managed in Backstage in this central catalog. And a concept that is really important for us is ownership. So we have a team that owns software and that team is responsible for that software end to end. And they use Backstage to, you know, debug failing data pipelines, to look at uh, metrics for their services, to uh, do rollbacks of, of like uh, unhealthy deploys and, and basically everything you can think about in the software development life cycle, they use Backstage for that. And if you look at on the left-hand side, the, uh, the sort of truth for this, for this catalog information is uh, a small YAML file that we put in together with your code and that kind of models what kind of software it is. So in this case, it's a service and it's named Podcast API. Um, and it, it has an owner and a bunch of other metadata fields. Uh, and let's say changing, an, changing the owner of a piece of software is basically sending a pull request to this metadata file uh, to change the owner. And then eventually Backstage basically goes in and crawls all these uh, metadata files that lives in repositories and, and brings them together in a one central place. And what is really sort of the other dimension of Backstage, I talked about how we keep track of our software. It's not just an accounting system for keeping track of our software. What we have really done, I think in an interesting way is to, uh, once we have that central repository of all the software, we basically use that as a way to integrate your, the tools you need into that. I'm gonna show that very soon, but we have a concept of what we call plugins. So instead of, let's say, jumping into your Jenkins machines and like, you know, trying to find the build that you were looking for or 
going into a Kubernetes cluster and like you know finding uh, finding the right cluster and then finding like the service that you're looking for and then the pods. We use basically the information architecture in the service catalog. So the user comes in through a service, and on that service, there's a number of tools that are connected to it. Uh, we're going to show that later on. And with Backstage open source, what we're really hoping to, to achieve here is to build sort of this marketplace of plugins or an ecosystem of plugins. So if you remember that CNCF map that I showed you, it's really complicated and all the UIs and all the services are built differently. What we're trying to do here is basically introduce a common UX layer on top of all of those infrastructure uh, services or infrastructure tools. So that when a user uses Backstage, an engineer who would just want to ship code, they get a consistent experience, regardless if, if they're looking at API documentation or you know, uh, looking at their costs or, or looking at um, you know, the recent builds of their service. So all of this is enabled by us, hopefully, and it's already starting to happen, uh, basically enabling other companies to start contributing these plugins so that the ecosystem becomes richer and richer. Uh, Long-term goal is that whenever someone joins, like, you know, comes to Backstage, downloads it, uh, they should be free to pick up components or sort of plugins that are already built for all the tools that they're using. So if they're using Circle CI, there's a plugin for that. If they're using Datadog, there's a plugin for that. Grafana, there's a plugin for that, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and in that way, we have we create this UX layer across all the different tools. And we realized that like building this ecosystem is not something that Spotify can do ourselves. We don't want to. And we we really think that you know everyone has different infrastructure needs and we want to create sort of an open and vibrant community where people contribute to this where spotify is one of the contributors but one of many so this is one of the reasons why we are pretty excited to be uh, to, to announcing recently that we have donated uh, backstage to uh, the cncf the cloud native computing foundation uh, as a sandbox project which is initial the first step uh, and we're look, we're hoping to kind of bring it through all the way up to graduation, where you find projects like Kubernetes and Envoy and, and, and Prometheus and others. So the call to action here is like, you know, if this sounds exciting, uh, you are in need of like consolidating all your developer tools. Um, come and join us backstage IO and, and uh, we'll help answer your questions and, and uh, maybe get you uh, trying out backstage. So um, with that, I promise a demo um, and I'll switch over to the demo. Uh, here we go. So here's the product. Uh, when I start, uh, when I come to the first page, I can see I've logged into the system and I'm getting a nice welcome a message in Lithuanian. We, we randomly assign this, so it's like, you know, get some um, different languages in here. Uh, so basically here I can see what are all the services, my websites, libraries, documentation, and other kinds of software that, that my team is responsible for. So here I'm looking at the list of all the different services uh, that my specific team is owning. Uh, these are just example, uh, example services and microservices. Uh, I can also look at like all the services in my company so this is one of the advantages of having like a central place. Uh, we, Backstage makes it easier for me and my teams to manage the software we own, but I can just as easily tap into and find everything that exists inside our company. And this is really important when you have these autonomous teams that are building different pieces. It's easy to find each other. It's easy to see the relationship between the services. And it's also importantly easy to kind of find what APIs are available already out there in the, in my microservice uh, architecture. So I can I don't have to basically re uh, you know re implement things that are already built by other teams that I wouldn't have found if I didn't have this central repository. 
So in here, I can then filter. Let's say I want to just see things that are Go services, and and you know I just get those. These will obviously be thousands of services, and you know you can search across the fleet. But uh, for this demo purposes, this is it. Um, I can also go to a number of like starred services. Like this is like just the ones, my favorite ones. And um, the next part of sort of the user journey, I found the service that I'm looking for. Maybe this this sample service. I go into that, and what I get here is an overview of all the important information about this specific service. So I can view the source. I can you know easily jump over to GitHub to get to the source of this. I can view the technical documentation of it, um, and I get a bunch of other like you know example widgets here that shows like the the most important information about this service. And I talked about uh, plugins. Uh, basically, instead of giving people, forcing people to learn Jenkins or your other CI tool and jump into there and log into a separate system, uh, you have it all integrated into one place. So basically, I can click the CI button here, and there I get like all the recent builds that were happening for this specific service. Similarly, if I go to the API tab, I can see the API of, of the service, and I can see that in one consistent view. The same goes for, for documentation. This documentation is super interesting, but basically what we have in Backstage Open Source is a docs-like code approach where you write your technical documentation about your software, a service in this case. Uh, there could be a library, it's you know, a website, whatever. You write that in, uh, in Markdown files and put them together with your source code. And then during CI, Backstage sort of publishes uh, a nice looking documentation site and it's centrally available to find and read everyone's documentation in Backstage. So it keeps like an engineering focused workflow where engineers treat documentation just as any other code, uh, but there's a centralized way to find and consume the documentation about all the software in, in the system. I don't think this has a Kubernetes plugin. No, the plug Kubernetes uh, is not hooked up for this one. All right. So uh, there are other concepts uh, in Backstage. I mentioned APIs. We have all the different, uh, basically having a central, all these different services implements different APIs. And Backstage makes it possible for you to have a central repository of all your APIs in this API Explorer. So you can basically go in and look at this example, the Spotify open API specification. And I can look at that. I can you know, see how it's consumed. Uh, but I can also look at, let's say this is a GraphQL API. This particular uh, component has a GraphQL API. So if I look at that, Backstage is smart enough to show a different plugin that visualizes all of this, the GraphQL specific information. So I can here go here and I can browse through the uh, uh, browse to, through the, the GraphQL model and I can you know query it, etc. Uh, so this makes it possible to find like have a central place for all your things, but still you know uh, make it easy to consume the, the uh, APIs in, in, in the way they were meant to be consumed. Uh, another important aspect is. Uh, so basically, I've showed you a bunch of tools and how they integrate to the service catalog or on top of the software system that we have. Uh, another thing that we can do in Backstage is that we can basically build uh, a one of these plugins for any kind of standalone use case that you have. So basically, inside Spotify, we have built over 140 different plugins that like hook into various different parts of our infrastructure. Uh, and one of those examples, which we recently open sourced is, is this cost insights tool that we have. So I talked about how engineers basically own their own software. And we um, that means owning your own cost, owning your own security uh, uh, attributes for your services, for your, your infrastructure that you own. Basically, engineers own this thing end to end. And rather than forcing them to you know, jump into a separate cost tool and, you know, accounting and having managers like poke people about uh, their cost spend. 
uh, we try to make all of these different attributes part of the developer experience. So in this example, you can kind of see uh, your specific cloud cost over the past six months. Uh, you can see if, like the, how the trend is doing. And uh, interestingly, you can also see some kind of nudges here that like, oh, this, um, this service here has like increased its spend. Uh, all these, you know, this is just fake data, but this is an ex example of how, how it works. So you can see that, oh, this service actually started to use compute engine in, in a much bigger way than we had previously. That could be due to a bug or due to you know normal procedures, uh, but we can kind of nudge people and show information like, hey, if you if you clean this up, you could potentially save you know one engineer or this amount of carbon dioxide or you know uh, this amount of money for for your company. So this makes cost, which is a pretty you know boring thing and not really something that engineers typically want to do and we don't really want them to spend a lot of time thinking about but we make it like integrated as part of the developer experience and therefore it makes it less disruptive and, and also in some cases actually gamifies it uh, we do the same thing for migrations like tech migrations where we show leaderboards of different teams who have migrated from technology a to technology b we do the same thing for nudging people about, you know, fixing patching security problems, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you build one of these plugins then? Uh, we basically, uh, if you go to the Backstage IO website, uh, we have made it really, really simple to, to build one of these plugins. And a plugin is essentially a small web application that runs together with other plugins in a bigger uh, single page web application. Uh, and it, we really care about like consistency and the experience, as I've said before. So we want all the plugins to be looking similar, not identical, but like they should share the same UX patterns, etc. So regardless if you're using a Circle CI plugin or if you're like you know looking at your graphs in Datadog, uh, you should you should recognize the tools and they should feel familiar to you. So when you, it's not only just very easy to build a plugin. There's just a single command and you get like a, a plugin. But that plugin that you get uses our sort of uh, UX guidelines. And, and uh, this is an example of the uh, app that I, or the plugin that I created for all things open. Um, and I get basically like a, you know, hello world type experience out of the box with, where we give you like, you know, different uh, uh, different UI components that you can just use to put together your specific use case. And we even have a very rich like storybook, uh, you know, UI component library where you can, you know, be inspired by other plugins and you can see, you know, what the reusable UI widgets you have at your, your disposal. Um, and you can kind of pick and mix from existing stuff um, that, uh, when you do that, you kind of create a consistent experience for the end user. So that's about it. Uh, I, I think we have a few minutes uh, for, um, for Q and A. So I'll stop sharing my screen and, and I'll op leave, open the floor to, to you all for, uh, for questions. Just a heads up that you can post questions or comments to Stefan in one of three ways. You can use the chat stream, you can use Q&A, or you can raise your hand. Is there a live, uh, Surab, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, you asked about if there's a live demo Yes, one of the uh, one of the people in the backstage community has actually put up a, a demo, so you can go to. Maybe I can type the answer here: demo dot dot so. And there you can try it out for yourself.
this is not kind of a complete uh, demo or an official demo, but it's uh, it's one way to have a look at like an example an example deployment of Backstage. The the important part to bring with you is that Backstage is a it's built to be flexible. So regardless, we have it like whatever deployment we have of Backstage at Spotify. Uh, we don't expect companies to have a similar need or a similar setup. Uh, essentially, the view, what we want to enable is that you can create your version of Backstage and wire it together with your, uh, the kind of plugins and the, the core components that you want. I have a question, Stefan. I couldn't what? type into the Q&A for some reason. What, what was the effort to get the portal develop, develop, the developer portal to production? I'm just curious. It's, it's actually a pretty, long, it's a pretty long effort and it's been in development for uh, more than four years at, inside Spotify. It got, has undergone a number of different iterations uh, it actually started as a microservice catalog, like a read-only catalog for microservices. And then it accidentally became a platform almost. Um, and eventually we saw that there's a need to centralize all the tools. And then we kind of rebuilt Backstage as a proper platform with this plugin system that, I, uh, that we now open source. Um, so it's been a multi-year effort and one of the cool things that we have enabled inside Spotify is that there's not just a central team that builds the developer portal. We actually have over 60 different teams at Spotify who build these plugins. So uh, it's already like a very vibrant internal community of, of like people contributing and building their own parts of Backstage. Thank you. Any other questions? I can just pitch that there's, if you go to the Backstage IO site, uh, there's also a bunch of demo videos. Uh, or we did, uh, when we launched Backstage, we did a number of recordings and demos of how we use it inside Spotify. The open source project is still you know, I said we have 140 different internal plugins and it's been developed over a lot of years. Uh, so the open source project is still fairly new, like six, seven months. Uh, so it's not as feature rich as our internal version. Uh, but if you want to get on like a sense of what this could be in the future or what it could, you know, could become to have like this central developer portal, um, check out those videos to get a better, better sense. I have another question. Mm, go ahead. So, yeah, you mentioned that the the uh, the number of days that it took someone to get up and running was went from fifty five to twenty two days. Yes. I'm curious when you did the ROI initially. Do you know whether that was about what you were going for? That's an amazing number, by the way. Yeah, it is really, and it's kind of funny to. Eat when you look at the graph, it was going up, steadily going up, and then we launched Backstage and then it started to go down. <laughs> I don't think we can claim like all, all that because there's a lot of different, you know, things involved in onboarding an engineer. But, and to be, to be brutally honest, we, we didn't really use that number as a way to, you know, motivate Backstage. It was more driven from sort of a obsession to kind of simplify the lives of our engineers and we did a lot of user research like went out and talked to engineers at Spotify and we found that they were struggling with primarily two different things first you know this tooling proliferation that I talked about they just needed to know about all the hundreds of different tools that are very available the second part was that they didn't know even where to start looking for information so in this world of 
three, four hundred autonomous teams building software and everyone documenting their things in different ways, putting it in markdown files and Google Docs and wikis and you know private Slack channels. There was no starting point to to find like tap into the information stream of Spotify's engineering. So that was like the second biggest problem we saw. And Backstage kind of addresses both those uh, two problems in the same way. It, it brings all the tools in together. Uh, and it also basically brings all of our technical documentation into one place and standardizes it. And then we saw kind of as this model, as more and more teams started exposing their infrastructure in Backstage, it started to become evident that this was a better model, both for the teams building the actual infrastructure, as well as the users of you know, all those things. And another thing that we are kind of looking at is what we call T-shaped engineers. Uh, so you have your depth where you are, let's say you're a backend developer, but you also have a breadth. Let's say you can do a little bit of machine learning or you can do, you know, help out with some data science uh, work. And simply by having all your tools in one place and the tools being consistent, like dramatically reduces the barrier of entry for you to you know, do something else as well. Uh, I think in our machine learning space, this has been really interesting to watch. I mean, you, you no longer need a PhD in, in our machine learning in order to do the basics. You can do that in, in one consistent experience in Backstage, like next to your other tools. You, you may not get like, you know, the deepest experience, but at least you get some and you can, you know, start to tap into other domains and become more T-shaped. just amazing to see a company actually invest in something <clears throat> like this. I mean, it makes absolute sense. Do you think that you see other companies moving in the direction of creating uh, portals or creating tools like that for their engineers? Just yeah, I think that we have, before we released Backstage as open source, we kind of went out and talked to companies in our, you know, similar to Spotify, um, you know, with, you know, similar technology stacks and similar engineering cultures, et cetera. And what we heard was that they all were struggling with basically the same problems, like autonomy and, and choices is great, but it also creates chaos. Like if you don't, you know, standardize it, if you don't, you know, mm -hmm. put, put some boundaries or guardrails around it. Uh, and I think what we, what we saw was that we had, we had come further than many others. And this is one of the reason why we had, why we released Backstage as open source. And I think just looking at the reception that we've had so far with the project, uh, I got, I, I put my name like on, on the, on, in the project. Uh, and we've got, we got them, I think we got like 250 companies or something like that reaching out to like, Hey, we want to demo this. Uh, we have the same problem. Like we're looking, we've been looking for a solution like this or like looking for a, a solution to this problem. Uh, and uh, yeah, so there's definitely a lot of companies now that are uh, starting to see the need or starting to understand, you know, they have seen the need before, but now they have a, you know, a starting point for a solution. And uh, they are starting to jump into backstage, starting to use it, starting to contribute back uh, with plugins and core, core features as they are sort of, they're taking backstage and building their version of their developer portal internally. So we're pretty excited about that. That's great. Uh, Surabi, um, how many of the internal plugins do you plan to make open source? Have you had uh, people outside of Spotify contribute new plugins? Yeah. So first of all, uh, yes, we're, there's a bunch of different teams at Spotify who are now working to release their plugins as open source. Uh, I already demoed a few, like we have, for example, the tech docs team with technical documentation, we call it tech docs, like not an invented name. Um, they recently open sourced uh, that solution as part of Backstage. Uh, I also show the cost insights uh, tool, which is another uh, plugin internally that we have open sourced. And there's a bunch of other examples. I think we have released, let's say 10 or so different plugins. But the reality is that even though Spotify uses a lot of 
you know, cloud native technologies and open source, a vast amount of those plugins that we have are Spotify internal. And they, you know, they expose some legacy system that we only, that only makes sense for us. So I think it's not at all reasonable to think that we will, you know, open source the vast majority of those 140 plugins. And it's not just because we don't want to or don't have time to, but it's actually that those are just so specific to Spotify that they don't wouldn't make sense for anyone else, actually. Uh, but we are gradually sort of adopting more open source technologies. And, and for that, they can also use more of the plugins that are coming from the community. Uh, the other part of your question is, uh, have people outside contributed? Yes. So I showed that uh, if you go to the backstage.io slash plugins, there's already like a starting to become sort of a marketplace or a gallery of different things. And those, I think 50% of the plugins have, have been contributed by other companies. My favorite example is a, um, and this is where we start to see you know, real value for also for Spotify, like coming from the community is that there was a company who were really excited about this. They had worked on API documentation for a very long time, uh, but they didn't have a central developer portal. They had a, uh, basically a API portal with only that use case. So they saw an opportunity to kind of take that work that they had and bring it in as a plugin in backstage. Uh, and now we have this central, know system where you can see a link between your stuff in the catalog to the api that exposes and that's actually not something that we had at spotify before so we are i mean it's really cool to see already now that we can start to not only contribute but also like sort of start to import innovation from other companies if from the community back into spotify that's just one example and there's a few more Answer live. There's not another question. I have another one. <laughs> I have lots of questions. This yeah. is really interesting. Are there any plans or tending toward, um, since you have plugins, a model of premium plugins that people pay for? Just curious when I think plugins. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting uh, idea and uh, not really something that we are looking into right now. But I mean, you can look at if you're familiar with the Grafana project, for example. Uh, I believe they also have like a plugin marketplace where you know some plugins are open source and some are kind of you know uh, have a license connected to them or you have to pay for them. Uh, and I definitely think you know if Backstage becomes as successful as we hope it to be, I think there will be a market for uh, you know for reselling your developer tooling in, through a form of a plugin. Uh, I think that could be another fantastic way to kind of make sure that these plugins, I mean, if there's a monetization possibility for the plugin developer, they're more likely to spend more time developing that plugin, right? So, and that means a better plugin and a better developer experience for everyone. So I, um, I think the, uh, we'll see what happens in the future, but this is, I think it's an interesting, uh, interesting space. You can almost look at it. We have talked about it like, what is an app store for the develop, for developer tools, basically? Maybe Backstage, you know, in some future could become that marketplace or that app store, essentially. Even though app stores have a you know, tough time right now in terms of <laughs> uh, political aspects, but still, still the concept is interesting, I think. Thank you. I think there might also be an interesting avenue for, you know, companies that are selling developer tools. Let's say a company like SNCC who's doing like, you know, uh, scanning, security scanning. That's a service that you buy and integrate in your environment. And if there's a plugin or already for that, like it, it just shortened the, the integration time. A customer that's a pe person, a team that already has backstage, uh, they should probably be able to like, you know, 
install that plugin and, and get started with that developer tool more easily than than if you would have to have you know go in and sell it as like a standalone service. So I think there's a lot of interesting possibilities. Absolutely. Yeah. Hi, Corey. Hi. Did you have a question? No, I'm just signing in for my session. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I'm just trying to get my screen going here. Sorry. <laughs> I said I've signed in for my session. I was told to sign in 15 minutes early for our session. I'm just a couple minutes early. So if there are no more questions, uh, I <laughs> would love to just encourage everyone to, I mean, if this sounds interesting, uh, reach out, go to Backstage IO, uh, or we have a Discord open uh, channel where you can go and, and like chat with the team who's building this and get help to get started. Um, and uh, you'll also find me in there. So I'll be happy to have answer any questions you may have in the future as well. <laughs>